In your copy of God's Word, would you turn, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 6, found on pages 426 and 427 in your pew Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 6. I wish you would keep it open. We'll be looking at most of all of this chapter this morning. This is the third in a series of Adventures of the Lost Ark. Recall that last week we talked about the raided, being raided by the lost ark, of how the ark had been captured by the Philistines and everywhere he went. Uh, statues fell on their faces before him. People began to have plagues of bubonic plague and to have tumors that were visible and showing, not only embarrassing but, but indicating the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them. And today we look at a chapter that talks to us about when judgment is ended and what happens when judgment is ended. 1 Samuel 6 Let's read the first three verses and then refer to the rest as we go along. When the ark of the Lord had been in the Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. And they answered, If you return the ark of the Lord of Israel, of the God of Israel, do not send it away empty but by all means send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. And you recall the story goes on about how they made these golden objects of the tumors and the rats. The rats had caused the bubonic plague and, and they made these, these golden uh, replicas of those two things that had been a part of God's judgment. And they built a brand new cart and they decided that they would test God one more time to maybe see if he really was doing this. And so they said, we're going to separate two cows from their calves. And we're going to take calves that, cows that have never been yoked together and trained to pull an oxen. And we're going to yoke them to this oxen. If they wander around confused and don't know where they're going, then we'll know that all of this happened by chance, that God didn't do it, that it all happened by chance. But if those cows make a straight line to the border without going returning to their calves and without showing confusion of not knowing how to be yoked together, well, then we'll know that the Lord's hand has indeed been heavy upon us and he has been the one who has caused our judgment. Well, they did that, separated the cows from their calves. They yoked them to the brand new cart they had made. They put the ark on the cart with the gold sacrifice pieces that they had made and then they let it go. And those cows made a straight line toward the border, not veering, says the word, to one way or the other. It says all the way they were lowing. Now, those of us who grew up in the country think this means they were calling for their calves. And even though they were obeying the instinct of God within them, telling them what to do, they were still lowing and calling for their calves. One city preacher decided that this lowing meant that the cows were singing. You know, some song like Onward Christian Bovine. I don't know. But, but they, went, they went straight up and straight to the border. They went right into the town across the border through the valley where all the people were working, harvesting their crops, went right up to the great big rock, the place of sacrifice on Joshua, not, not the Joshua uh, who fought the battle, but there were a lot of Joshuas in that day, the local Joshua. And they came to that big rock, and there the cattle stopped dead still. And there the people made an altar fire out of the wood from that ark and they sacrificed those cattle and rejoiced that God had brought the ark back to them. And the word says in verse 16 that those five Philistine kings who made up the reigning royalty of the land of Philistine, that these people saw all of this and then went back to their city. They saw it all. What do you think about when bad things happen to you? When bad things happen, what are your options? What do you think? Well, I guess we could think it just happened by chance. It just happened by chance, just one of those things that happened. Uh, there was a rabbi, Fulgham, who wrote a best-selling book in religious field entitled, in, in you remember the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. I think a better question would have been why good things happen to bad people. But he asked the question, why do, good things ha why do bad things happen to good people? Well, that's a good question, but his answer was underwhelming. His answer was that life is kind of a roulette wheel and it just stops wherever it wants to and it doesn't pick anybody out and says this is for you and this is for you. It's just all part of a sort of a random selection thing and life is kind of just a roulette wheel. It happens by chance. 
It was Albert Einstein, the great scientist that I think who had the best answer to that. He said, God doesn't play dice. He really doesn't. Thinking that it happened by chance is one of the options when something happens to you. The other option is to think that this is a matter of what the Bible calls suffering of the saints. That it's a time that God is testing us. It's not necessarily a, a forcing these things to happen. Usually they're results of something we have done, but he allows this to happen because it's a way to test those who are his people. Now in Romans 5 and many other places, the Bible tells us something about this suffering for him, for this testing tells us the Romans 5 begins by talking about the peace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And then he said, those who have that peace rejoice, he said, when you face sufferings. And he talks about how this suffering leads to the building of your character and a lot of other things. But these three things, I think, are consistent in the Bible about suffering, about Christian suffering. One is that it will bring glory to God's kingdom. It will benefit the kingdom of God. The other is it will benefit you. Have you ever experienced when you've gone through some times and they've been tough and hard times and the amazing thing is that later you thank God for the experience because it taught you and benefited you so very much? If it's Christian suffering, if it's something God is allowing for your development, then it's something that will benefit the kingdom, it will benefit you, and you will learn to rejoice in it. That's consistently taught in the Bible. Rejoice in your suffering, says Romans 5, 3. Uh, James says, brothers, count it all joy when you face the different kinds of trials in this life. Those three things are consistent when there's Christian suffering. What's left? Well, what's left is judgment. What's left is punishment. In this story, God is punishing a rebellious nation, his people. He is also punishing people who will not recognize him and will not worship him. This punishment thing is very much there. I remember so very clearly in seminary one day, one of my friends, we were all young preachers and had country churches, and one of my friends said, you know, there is a family in our church who is being judged by God, and they can't see that, and professor, how do I tell them? And the professor said, my young son, you do not know who's being judged by God, and you never will know who's being judged by God. That is not your decision to make. But if we are being judged by God, I think we can know if we really want to to know. And this scripture tells us why judgment comes from God. Why? It comes from hard hearts. It comes from soft minds. It comes from unforgiven sins. These are the scriptures that tell us those things. In, in verse 6, he says, why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? And said, when they did that, God treated them harshly. In verse 9, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemeth, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know it was not his hand that struck us and that it happened to us by chance. You have to if you're going to overcome the judgment. Judgment ends when we quit operating from a soft mind and begin to sharpen our wits and understand that we yield to the sovereignty of God. And judgment ends when our sins are forgiven, when some sort of sacrifice is made for our sins. That's written into almost every line in this chapter. Now, judgment ends when our hearts are softened toward God. The Bible speaks a great deal about hard hearts and how important the heart is. He said, why do you harden your hearts in verse 6? Why, why do you harden your hearts? The Bible is a book of questions. The very first question in the Bible is, uh, where are you? God is still asking that question. He comes into wherever you are and wherever he's put you and says, where are you? And then the next question, if the first one's so searchingly personal, the second one is so searchingly social. The question is, where is your brother? He asked that to Cain. Where is your brother? That's important, should be important to all of us. The third question that we find in the Bible is, is your heart right? Is your heart right? That's important because out of your heart comes all the issues of life. The Bible says that God doesn't look at the outward appearance of people. He doesn't see how religious we seem to be. He doesn't look at how wonderful we seem to look. He looks in our hearts. He reads our hearts. 
the song, the beautiful song that we sung a while ago, we are seekers of your heart. That's true, we should be seeking the heart of God. But do you understand that one of the primary teachings of God's Word is that He is seeking our hearts? Is your heart right? Remember the thing about David? He must not have looked like a king because when David's father Jesse was told that the Samuel the prophet was coming to anoint the new king and deepen his family, David wasn't even invited to the meeting. He wasn't tall. Everybody thought kings were to be tall. He wasn't an overbearing thing. He was, he was the last son. I was the baby of the bunch. You don't get to be very commanding when you grow up as the baby of the bunch. He was not kingly in many, many ways. And yet he was the one. Why? The Scripture says, God explained this by saying that God looks on the heart and not on the outward appearance. You recall that David wanted to build that temple, wanted so badly to build that temple, but he wasn't allowed to. But God said to him, David, I'll count it to your account as though you had built the temple because it was in your heart. In Proverbs, the Scripture says, the heart reflects the person. What's in your heart is what you really are. Remember how Jesus quoted and how the Bible says that God was so angry with people. He said, they worship me with their lips. They honor me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. You believe in your heart. Remember Romans 9, it says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God has raised us from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart, it says in verse 10, for with the heart we believe. The psalmist prayed, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The heart is your attitude. The heart is your conviction. The heart is the thing for which you live. Now, that's why in Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, lay your treasure up in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And God is always interested in the answer to the question, is your heart right? not rebellious and angry, not unconfessing and afraid. Is your heart right? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, said Jesus, for I'm with you. He's interested in the heart. And you will begin to see the end of judgment when you stop having a hard heart toward God and begin to be soft and pliable to him. And this leads into a very natural second step. You will begin to see the end of judgment. When you sharpen your mind, when you quit having a soft head and start having a sharp mind, and you understand that you must submit to the, to the sovereignty of Almighty God. But, if it, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemus, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us and that it happened to us by chance. It happened to us by chance. The Lord didn't do it. But they learned that day the Lord did do it. They saw what those cows did. They, they saw how the people received the ark. They saw the sacrifice of the people to the Lord God they saw what happens when judgment ends, and they understood that the Lord's hand was heavy upon them in judgment. And judgment ends when we begin to see that, when we begin to understand that He is sovereign, almighty God. And that's a vital thing. Do you understand how vital that is right now at this point in history? God's Word is always as, as up-to-date and contemporary as this morning's newspaper, but this is a most vital point at this day in history, for you and I are seeing a philosophy crumble and fall all around us. It's a philosophy we were taught in school. It's a philosophy we have lived by in this land, especially in many, many years. It's a philosophy that embodies what we call the American dream, and it's dying. Secular, rationalistic humanism is dying. And it's not just preachers who are saying that. Scientists are saying that. Not just social scientists are saying that, but other kinds of scientists too are saying that. A Rutgers University biological scientist has written a book entitled The Arrogance of Humanism. 
And he recognized that humanism did contribute some ideas of dignity and, and freedom to people. But he said there are more dark sides to it than there are light. And he said the most dangerous thing about secular rationalistic humanism is its idea of progress. It is the lie of progress. It was the lie that somehow through science and through our own efforts and through our own minds we could make things better. We could make people different. We could somehow take charge of things and we could improve our lives. And the idea was that we could use science and science would take us to paradise. But where has science taken us? It's taken us to Jurassic Park. Have you ever wondered why the movies 30 years ago were talking about the wonderful things that were coming in the future? All the wonder, what are the movies about today? About a future that's tragic? about a place where the creatures that science has created turn and devour us. That's the theme of so many. The people who are making movies, the people of science, are seeing that the, that the rationalistic humanism lie, uh, statement was a lie, that progress is a lie. We're not progressing. Now, I'm not knocking science. I'm very grateful to science. Science has done so many wonderful things, but the, the problem with all this is that secular rationalistic humanism has not recognized that there's something terribly wrong with the human. And we put untold power in the hands of people who have no God in their hearts, and we've seen atrocities all over our world. We're seeing them today. There is no progress. There's decline. We were told that somehow if science would help us live better, if we would cool our homes and if we could have beautiful automobiles and we could have ways of getting around and if, and if we could get all of our needs met and we could be made comfortable, then people would stop things like rape and murder and killing and all of these things that are happening. Didn't work, did it? You read any newspapers lately? Been looking at any news lately that may give lie to the idea if you make people rich, they're going to be good? One guy checked in a hotel the other, in a hospital the other day. He said, I've OD'd on OJ. We have, not, we have not gotten better. The statement of progress is a lie. What's happened is that we are able to engineer some changes without knowing what those changes are going to lead to, and often they lead to much more problems than we already had. And that's the lie of secular, rationalistic humanism. And we're seeing that lie portrayed in movies. We're seeing that lie written in books. We're seeing not just the preacher saying, in fact, the scientists are saying it more than the preachers are. We have not come to be better. We've come to be worse because we believe in ourselves. And apparently it is not ourselves that can be believed in. Well, the thing that really bothers me is that people, as we are undeniably rejecting the obvious fact that secular rationalistic humanism doesn't work, and because of that, we may drive all the way across the ditch and crash in the ditch on the other side of the road of truth and make the same mistake as these unenlightened, uneducated people of 1 Samuel who said, it's all probably just chance. It's all probably just happened by chance. It, ju it just happens, that's all. It just happens by chance. Let me ask some questions. Does chance have any power? What is chance? What can chance influence? What can chance cause to happen? What ability does chance have to change anything? Chance is a word of mathematical probability. It's a word that describes what happens if you flip a coin or, or roll a roulette wheel or drive a car or fly in a plane. It figures probability. Do you think chance can create and yet I hear supposedly intelligent people saying like, I believe the world was created by chance. What in the world can chance create? What in the world can chance cause to happen? 
Where is there one shred of evidence that chance has any power to do anything at all? Chance can do nothing because chance is nothing. Chance is no thing. It is nothing. It has no power. Out of nothing comes nothing. R.C. Sproles asked the question, what is the chance that the world was created by chance? And the answer is not a chance. Not a chance. It is our conviction that God is the creator of the world. It is our conviction that God is in charge of his world. It is our conviction that history is his story and it will come out exactly like God wants it to come out. And he allows us in his free will to make a lot of mistakes and to reap the problem with that. He wants to be loved and he can't force you to be what you ought to be, but still it's his world. He'll bring it to his conclusion. We read in Psalm 27 that the earth is, the, or 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world belongs to God and all the people on it. When the greatest king, maybe of all history, when Nebuchadnezzar was being judged by God for his pride mostly, and when Nebuchadnezzar was being judged by God, he had Daniel say to him, it is he who rules in all the kingdoms of the earth and he will give them to whoever he pleases. God is in control. Jesus one day says, Philippians 2 will come again and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Revelation, one of the last lines we read in that book is the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And if you think there is judgment in your life, if there is something that is not in you, that's happened to you, that has not benefited the kingdom of God or cannot, cannot benefit you and you cannot feel joy about it, if you feel there's judgment in your life, then understand that you must soften your hard heart and you must activate your soft mind and quit dreamily thinking, unthinkingly thinking that things happen just by chance and accept the fact that God is sovereign. The third thing is the judgment is ended when a sacrifice is made for our sins and our sins are forgiven. The pagans were told by their leaders, you've got to make a sacrifice to him. And they did. As soon as the ark came into the, into the place where the Israelites were, they rejoiced and they were glad to see it, but immediately they made sacrifice. Those cattle who were following the will of God following the direction of the sovereign God, working against everything in their nature not to leave their cattle, working against everything in their nature not to have been broken to those yokes and to be wild and run in separate directions, pulled together, went all the way without turning one way or the other, went straight to the place, stopped at the place of sacrifice, and there those cattle were sacrificed. Years later, the Lamb of God came, and he wouldn't listen to the calls of people for what they thought were the vital things of life and the way that they would lead him off of his thing. He wouldn't listen to their cries of political activity. He rather made a beeline toward Jerusalem. And there he died on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. What if? You like to play what if. I think you learn a lot by playing what if. What if one day you have to stand on trial for your life? not your 90 or 80 or 70 or 40 or 50 or 60 years life, but your everlasting, never-ending, forever, never going to stop life, eternity. What if you're on trial for that life? And the charge is that you are not fit for heaven. And you learn that the only other place that's left is hell, and that's the sentence if you're found guilty. And you decide to get a lawyer that you understand has been good in these kind of cases and does the best thing, highly recommended by many people. And you employ that lawyer. And what if on the day you walk into the trial, 
you learn that your lawyer is the judge. I bet O.J. would go for a case like that. Your lawyer is your judge. The Bible says that God the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to his Son. The Bible says we shall all stand before the judgment bar of Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the advocate of all of those who turn to him for salvation. And one day when you stand on trial for your never-ending, everlasting, never-going-to-stop kind of life, the one you will spend eternity and much longer, of course, than this one, won't it be great if the judge is your lawyer? And he can be because he made that sacrifice for our sins. And on that sacrifice, he paid our sin debt. He atoned for our sins. He assured our future, and he gave us everlasting life. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Father, I pray you'll help us to see that our lives are not our own. And when we try to make them our own and when we try to be God in our lives, we bring so much judgment upon ourselves. But the judgment is ended when our hearts become soft and not hard, when our minds stop being soft and start being sharp and accept what is readily apparent, that cha chance cannot create anything, that you are the creator and you're the sustainer and you're our hope of life, you're sovereign. And, O oh Lord, when we see that there must be sacrifice for sin, and Jesus Christ came and made that sacrifice for all of us so we can be free and the judgment will be ended. Thank you, Lord, for that. In his name, amen. We invite you now to come and let us know you want to receive Christ as Savior or you have received Christ as Savior and you want to schedule your baptism. Let me announce now that this afternoon at 5 o'clock in the chapel, I'd like to meet all of you who would like to talk about this decision to receive Christ and those who would like to be baptized. And if you want to be baptized tonight, bring with you some clothes just to get wet in and we'll give you towels and robes to put over them. But we want to have a baptism in this evening service. And I'd like to meet all of you who are interested in that at 5 o'clock and let's talk about what it means and what it's all about in the chapel at 5. And we issue this invitation now that you would come and make public decisions that honor him Christians, your decision could mean a great deal. You know you're going to have opportunity in just a moment to go to a room behind the sanctuary choir level here and, and to talk to people about any commitments you want to make because we don't want to miss any opportunity for you to be right with God. But it is so encouraging that you come publicly. It means so very much to us that you come and introduce yourself to this family and say, hey, I want to be part of you. I really do. And we want that too. So as we stand quietly and reverently, would you come just now and do his will just now?